Almost 50 years before the mechanical recording of the human voice, the English journalist Henry Mayhew began to compile a natural history of London's labouring poor. He roamed the streets of mid-19th century London, armed with nothing more than patience, shorthand, and what seems to have been a remarkable ear for the peculiarities of idiomatic English. He recorded the witness of several thousand men and women who plied their meagre and uncertain trades in the Victorian metropolis. Mayhew hoped to extract some large-scale scientific generalization from the inquiry, but in the event he was overwhelmed by the sheer quantity and richness of his material, so that by his own standards the enterprise was a failure. But Mayhew's failure turns out to have been our good fortune because of the unprecedented archive of personal experience which he bequeathed. Without the benefit of a tape recorder, we can virtually hear the anonymous inhabitants of a world that we have now lost. Everything is sacrificed, Mayhew wrote, in the struggle to live, I, and to live merely. Mind, heart and soul are all absorbed in the belly. And yet, as he himself showed, the higher functions were also catered for by people like this man, who toted his microscope around the streets and charged a penny a time for a peep. I began my street life with exhibiting a telescope. I gave up the telescope for this reason. My brother-in-law was going to America and was anxious to call in all his money. The telescope was sold. And my sister, the professed cook, fearing that I should be without a means of living, bought for me a microscope out of her own earnings, which cost her five pounds. She said, the microscope is better than the telescope, for the nights are so uncertain. She was quite right. For when the telescopes have been idle for three months at a time, I can exhibit my microscope day and night. She gave it to me as a mark of her respect. That instrument has enabled me to support an afflicted and aged mother and to bury her comfortably when she died. My microscope contains six objects which are placed on a wheel at the back which I turn round in succession. The objects are in cell boxes of glass. The objects are, all of them, familiar to the public and are as follows. One, the flea. Two, the human hair or the hair of the head. Three, the section of the old oak tree. Four, the animalculi in water. Five, cheese mites. And six, the transverse section of cane used by schoolmasters for the correction of boys. I always take up my stand in the daytime in Whitechapel, facing the London Hospital, being a large open space and favourable for the solar rays, for I light up the instrument by the direct rays of the sun. At night time, I am mostly to be found on Westminster Bridge, and then I light up with the best sperm oil there is. I'm never interfered with by the police. On the contrary, they come and have a look and admire and recommend, such is the interest excited. The first I exhibit is the flea, and I commence a short lecture as follows. Gentlemen, the first object I have to present to your notice is that of a flea. I wish to direct your attention especially to the head of this object. Here you may distinctly perceive its proboscis or dart. It is that which perforates the cuticle or human skin, after which the blood rises by suction from our body into that of the flea. Thousands of persons in London have seen a flea, have felt a flea, but have never yet been able, by the human eye, to discover that instrument which made them sensible of the flea about their person, although they could not catch the old gentleman. Having shown you the head and shoulders, with its dart, I shall now proceed to show you the posterior view of this object in which you may clearly discover every artery, vein, muscle and nerve exact like a lobster in shape and quite as large as one at two shillings and sixpence. That pleases them, you know. And sometimes I add, to amuse them, an object of that size would make an excellent supper for half a dozen persons. That pleases them. 
One Irish woman, after seeing the flea, threw up her arms and screamed out, Oh, Jesus! And I've had hundreds of them in me bed at once. She got me a great many customers from her exclamations. You see, my lecture entices those listening to have a look. Many listeners say, ain't that true and philosophical and correct? And I've had some give me sixpence and say, never mind the change. Your lecture is alone worth the money. Now proceed to number two. The next object I have to present to your notice, gentlemen, is that of the hair of the human head. You perceive that it is nearly as large as yonder scaffolding poles of the House of Lords. I say that when I'm on Westminster Bridge, because it refers to the locality and is a striking figure and excites the listeners. Now comes number three. This, gentlemen, is the brave old oak. A section of it not larger than the head of a pin. Looking at it through this powerful instrument, you may plainly perceive millions of perforations or pores through which the moisture of the earth rises in order to aid its growth. Of all the trees of the forest, none is so splendid as the brave old oak. This is the tree that braves the battle and the breeze and is said to be in its perfection at 100 years. Who that looks at it would not exclaim in the language of the song, Woodman, spare that tree and cut it not down. Number four is the animalculi in water. Gentlemen, the object now before you is a drop of water that may be suspended on the needle's point, teeming with millions of living objects. This one drop of water contains more inhabitants than the globe on which I stand. They are all moving with perfect ease, like the mighty monsters of the vast deep. The next object is the cheese mite, number five. I always begin in this way. Just look at them. Notice, for instance, the head, how it represents the form of an hedgehog. They have eight legs and eight joints and are said to be moving with the velocity of 500 steps in one minute. The cheesemonger in Whitechapel brought me a few of these objects for me to place in my microscope. He invited his friends, which were taking supper with him, to come out and take a glance at the same objects. He gave me sixpence for exhibiting them to him and was highly gratified at the sight of them. I asked him how he could have the impudence to sell them for a lady's supper at tenpence a pound. The answer he gave me was, what the eye cannot see, the art never grieves. Then I go on. Whilst this lady is extending her hand to the poor, she is slaying more living creatures with her jawbone than ever Samson did with his. If it's a boy looking through, I say. Now, Jack, when you're eating bread and cheese, don't let it be said that you slay the mites with the jawbone of an ass. Cultivate the intellectual and moral powers superior to the passions, and you will rise superior to that animal in intellect. Good, says a gentleman. Good, here's sixpence for you. And another says, here's tuppence for you. And I'm blessed if I want to see anything after hearing your lecture. Next comes the cane, number six. The object before you, gentlemen, is a transverse section of cane, common cane. Such, mark you, as is used by schoolmasters for the correction of boys who neglect their tasks or play the wag. I make it comic, you know. This I call the tree of knowledge, for it has done more for to learn us the rules of arithmetic than all the vegetable kingdom combined. Time Watch returns to BBC Two in two weeks. Next tonight, it's the Money Programme.